Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning, uh, taking time out of your busy schedules. I know it's a crazy time for everyone, but uh, today we'd like to just talk a little bit about moisture mitigation. Uh, first, we're going to go over why as an industry we need to think about it and how it will affect us. Uh, and then to do that, we need to understand what the root causes of a lot of these problems are, and then how, as flooring contractors, we can identify these moisture problems and protect ourselves from you know, any of these problems. Uh, finally, we'll try to discuss our product, the Covara Moisture Barriers, as a possible solution for you all, and uh, just a way, you know, another tool that you can have in your bag. But 20% of flooring products, I'm sorry, projects will identify as having a moisture issue uh, that's considered above 75% relative humidity in the slab. Uh, mitigation solutions are usually uh, proposed only after we find out that there's an issue and you know our common epoxies add a lot of time and money to those situations. Uh, throughout the industry 70% of industry experts do report that moisture is a frequent problem, so we do know that this is something that we've had. 50% uh, of on-grade slabs will not pass a 75% RH test, and 20% of concrete slabs on grade will require mitigation above a 95% relative humidity. So it's a problem that is widespread. Uh, these moisture issues can cause a lot of different problems for the flooring industry. Uh, you have distorted flooring, surface staining, and the reemulsification of adhesives. Uh, we have a few pictures here just showing a lot of the different problems. All of these, even the, the pictures on the left, were uh, had floor covering over them that was failing. And as we pulled it up, you know, we exposed a lot of different problems. The impact on the public uh, can range from just a simple aesthetic problem to actual tripping and falling hazards as the flooring becomes loose and starts to peak and bubble, um, and can also lead to mold and mildew growth. Uh, right here, we actually have a picture. This was all covered up uh, when we started opening it up. We had a, an old cutback adhesive. Underneath that was a dash patch, and there had just been multiple layers over, over time, and when it got covered up, a lot of mold and mildew growth was was present and caused a lot of problems uh, in a place that that could not happen. Uh, the other impact on the public is once everyone has moved in, the commercial remodeling delays can be a problem. Uh, right here we have a, a lift job that we were in. Again, it was a, a failed flooring system. You can see we were working at night with a lot of existing furniture. And anytime you're having to, you know, redo these things in that type of situation, it's a major problem. Uh, our next slide is a retail project. Again, this was a flooring failure. You can actually see the store was open. We were going in at night trying to remedy these problems. And, you know, just nobody's happy when you have these kind of problems, especially after the fact. Uh, going into the causes of these moisture issues, uh, we have a lot of different things to talk about. Uh, the industry trends uh, with the flooring materials and adhesives add to it. Uh, the aggressive fast track schedules of these construction products are, you know, a, a problem. Concrete trends have changed, and again, the adhesives uh, have come down in, you know, our VOCs and just have a completely different chemical makeup from what they did years ago. Uh, one of the biggest things with the fast track schedules is that the slabs just are not getting enough time to dry. Uh, a concrete slab actually takes 28 days to cure, but it can take at least 45 to 90 days to actually start to dry out. Uh, in the next slide, you can see the different effects that different water to concrete ratios will have in the drying time. Uh, these are all based off of your MVER or moisture vapor emission rates. And you can just see how a slight change uh, going from a 
water to concrete mix to a 0.5 water to concrete mix can have a huge effect on when you're going to hit different dry times. Uh, and you can have these, these changes within one truck if they have to water down the concrete a little bit more to get the, the end of it out, you can have a huge swing. The other trend in concrete itself is lightweight concrete and using an increase of fly ash. These will also require a longer dry time than our traditional heavyweight concretes. In this test, you can actually see that although the lightweight concrete actually has less water in it, the total water per assembly, because we've taken so many other things out of it, is actually a higher percentage of the composition of the concrete. Uh, anytime you have a higher percentage of concrete, obviously it's going to take a little bit longer for those slabs to dry to a place where we can install floor covering on top of them. Uh, right here we're showing a graph uh, comparing lightweight and our normal weight concretes. Uh, and how it will affect over one year. Now, this is on a unclimate-controlled slab, so you can see that actually in the winter you have a vapor emission rate that would be considered fine, but in the spring, as everything starts to warm up, you will get the water to start moving back up through the slab and possibly affecting your floor cover. Uh, so the moisture of convenience is actually water that is placed into the concrete uh, beyond what is needed for curing so that you know, we can work with the concrete. That will be oh, sorry, in every, every concrete that is poured. Uh, you can see in this picture the orange line coming across is actually the vapor barrier. So even in a properly, uh, you know, poured slab that is not getting any rehydration, you can have the possibility for a moisture condition. Obviously, any slab that does not have a, you know, a fully functioning vapor retarder will also have the possibility indefinitely of a moisture problem. Uh, uh, on the flooring side itself, we've seen a huge growth in, you know, impermeable floor coverings. Uh, you know, Broadloom was the standard for years, uh, and you are s starting to see a lot more hard surface going in, a lot more carpet tile, you know, with non-breathable backings. And all of this brings the moisture concerns to a head. Our adhesives have also changed uh, due to a lot of the regulations with the indoor air quality. Uh, we've gone from solvent-based adhesives to new water-based adhesives with completely different formulations and just a different effect uh, when exposed to high moisture and alkalinity. The kind of sum summarization of this, the drivers of increased uh, moisture issues. We have the fast track schedules, not allowing the concrete to dry out normally. Our concrete trends, you know, concrete, the concrete industry is working on just making concrete as hard and lightweight as they can. Uh, we're seeing denser, harder travel finish with increased fly ashes, just closing up the capillaries and really trapping that water in there for a longer time. Our new flooring materials are just a little more likely to show some of these moisture issues, and all of the green building requirements have changed our adhesives and the way they will react to high moisture and alkalinity. Uh, as, a, as a floor covering uh, contractor, there are different tests we can do to try to identify these issues before it becomes an actual problem. Uh, with the ASTM testing, we have the relative humidity or insight probe tests, calcium chloride testing, which will measure the MVER, pH testing, and then on a qualitative side, you have mat testing and plastic sheet testing. Uh, while these tests can tell you if you're going to have a problem, they 
give no true value, so they don't really have a lot more than just telling you there's a problem. Uh, your calcium chloride testing, uh, you have a picture above, is uh, governed by the ASTM F186911. And what you're doing is you are placing these calcium pellets into a exposed concrete uh, and measuring the weight gain to get how much vapor emission is coming out. It's expressed as a fraction over uh, pounds per thousand feet per 24 hours. The relative humidity testing uh, that most of the manufacturers have really now moved to is governed by the ASTM F2170. And what we're going to do here is place a probe at either 20 or 40 percent of the slab thickness, depending on how many sides it's drying from. And that's going to measure the expected equilibrium of the moisture in the slab once it has been capped. So that's going to give us a little more of a futuristic idea of what kind of moisture will be in that slab after we've done our, uh, our floor covering installation. Uh, the readers are very easy to read. Once you put it in, you will have your percentage. And the key is you have to go off the maximum reading, not the average of all the readings. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, You'll see people say they only have so many readings above it, but those are the ones that we're really worried about. Uh, you actually have to put three for the first thousand feet and then one for every thousand feet after, which is about the size of a concrete truck. So you're getting readings uh, that will give it. pH testing is part of the ASTM F710, uh, and it will give you basically the power of hydrogen on the surface of the concrete. Uh, this is important because when pouring a new slab, the concrete itself is very alkali, but carbonation will form on the surface of the slab, dropping the alkalinity down. Uh, when you have a moisture concern, the alkalinity can be brought back up from the movement of all the alkali salts uh, back up to the surface. Uh, the pH scale, and this is off of uh, basically a, a pH paper or litmus paper, uh, will give you different colors when you put it into the distilled water on top. Uh, you kind of have to match it up to the best you can. It really only works for whole numbers, and you can round to a half number in between. Uh, and all of your adhesives will have a maximum pH allowed. Uh, you will always see a floor, should always see a floor, I'm sorry, uh, above seven because concrete itself is a very alkaline material. Uh, the other way to test it would be an actual pH meter. Uh, kind of the beauty with it, it's put in exactly the same way, but it will give you an actual reading with a number, uh, and they have different levels of accuracy, uh, but they can work on up to a, a tenth of a decimal point and give you an exact reading for what it is. There's no interpretation, and it's a lot easier to document moving forward. Uh, this brings us up to the Kovara rolled moisture barriers. Uh, basically, we have a picture of a concrete slab with some moisture in it, and our rolled barrier will come across the slab, blocking the moisture from reaching the finished flooring and adhesives. Our seams are taped to give us a uniform barrier across the entire top of the slab and redirecting uh, the vapor away from the finished floor. The adhesive is then applied. There's no you know, blotter coat that is always required. Uh, we have a mineral top coat that will accept most floor coverings right away. And then the flooring is installed. Uh, the pros of it, it's very cost effective. It has been something that we've installed millions of feet over the last 10 years, and there is minimal prep or downtime really required to install this product. Um, our typical Ovara moisture barrier installation, uh, we start at 10 hours, uh, just basing it off of having to do some demolition and a little bit of prep work. Uh, that would be normal for any floor covering remodel. 
we're going to just remove all the adhesive, patch it out uh, up to the ASTM standard or to the requirements of the finished flooring needed. We're then going to apply uh, a double-sided tape that will join our seams. This double-sided tape does act as part of the moisture barrier as well. It is what prevents the moisture from attacking our seams and getting to the finished flooring. Uh, we will then roll out the material and pull the release liner on the top of the barrier. Uh, this is something that can be done right away and we'll start spreading glue. Uh, you can see in this picture, the uh, barrier has not even been installed all the way and they're already starting to spread glue. It's a very quick process and then you start installing the floor covering itself. Uh, typical time frame is about 13 hours and the cost basis is going to be about $1.80 to $3.80 a square foot. Uh, and this will give you protection uh, up to 99.5% relative humidity and 12 pH. Comparing it to a traditional epoxy, we base it off of 39 hours. That includes a lot of the dry time and different layers and coating, uh, $5 to $8 a square foot, obviously depending on markets, labor, and that does not include any of the downtime for the end user and your relative humidities are gonna you know, range from 76 to 100% and up to a 14 per, uh, pH protection. The other advantage to the Kovara moisture barrier is installations with furniture or in occupied spaces. You can see actually in the picture on the left, we've completed the installation up to furniture that could not be moved, that's a, a server on a cart, but we have gone in, moved the furniture that we could, pushed everything back, installed the Bovara and the finished floor, and we're just gonna pop the furniture back onto the finished floor and finish the room. On the right, you can see we can actually do lift jobs as well with the rolled membrane. Uh, so that's a completely occupied call center. We went in at night did the demo, rolled out the membrane, installed the flooring, and they were open in the morning. Uh, the newest development with the Kovara systems is our AB300, or the self-adhered. What we've done is we've taken our traditional Kovara membrane and we've applied a hydrophobic adhesive in a pattern on the back. Uh, we still by having a pattern and not a full spread, it allows for the vapor flow beneath the membrane and an equalization. Uh, we're still going to protect up to 99.5% RH. Uh, the liner has a split release down the center, so it's a very easy installation. And we'll never have to worry about, you know, a, a floating membrane with shifting or buckling from rolling loads and some of the less dimensionally stable floor coverings, we will no longer have to grid out as we have in the past. Uh, right here we have a couple pictures of the installation. You can see the on the left, the liners, you know, on both sides, the liner is being pulled off uh, from the sheet. It's only rolled about halfway back, simply just rolls back in and you have a fully adhered system. And that will bring us to the questions. And I can not see. All right, can you all hear me now? Hmm? Yes. All right, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties earlier. Um, so you mentioned that Kovara can be installed in an occupied space. Um, yep. What do you do about foot traffic over the exposed membrane? And how do you work around the furniture? Uh, the furniture, you would pro you would try to you know isolate to one side of the room, complete your demolition, rip up, uh, you know, adhesive removal, and Ovara installation. You want to minimize foot traffic on top of it. 
uh, I, I briefly mentioned, we have a mineral top coat that is designed to readily accept adhesives. So the more foot traffic you have on that, just the more you're risking a bond breaker getting on there. Um, it can be walked on, but it is a membrane. Uh, so if people are trying to do work on it, a, a tear would be a problem. They're easily repaired, but if you don't notice it, you know, it would be a little bit of a concern. Uh, the beauty of it is you can install the floor covering right away, so just cover it as quickly as possible. All right. Um, so how do you remove damaged finished flooring material um, if it's installed over Covara? That depends on the finished floor material and the adhesive used. Uh, you can heat it up if it's a releasable adhesive and get it off easily. Or if it's a hard set and that's just not a possibility, you can actually plunge cut through the Covara, you know, just trace the shape of the material. And then you would use the double-sided tape to create like a picture frame and drop a new piece in and reapply. But that's only if it's, you know, a hard set that you can't remove. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what is the required surface prep of the concrete substrate to receive Covara moisture barrier? We do not require profiling uh, on a remodel. We would, you just have to have all organic materials off of it, so any old adhesives and things like that. And as far as the prep itself, you're going to want to prep the substrate to the quality of the finished floor you're installing as far as smoothness and flatness. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What is the estimated production on a per person basis? In a base in a large area basic installation you can very confidently figure 750 square feet per man per hour. Uh, obviously, if it's a little more chopped up, the production will not always match that, but it's something you can really get down quickly. The other thing to keep in mind, uh, your, your floor covering installers can install this. You don't have to hire, you know, any kind of special crew and they can go right on top of it. Um, and you don't necessarily need your lead mechanic to be doing all of these with that. It's pretty simple. And this looks like this is the last one we have right now. Um, if anybody else has any other sort of questions for Dan and the team, um, we've got plenty of time left. So go ahead and submit those. Um, but the last one we've got right, for right now is is the product priced competitively? Yes. Uh, so it's it's priced very competitively. Uh, we are sold through distribution, uh, and we have a couple different products. So you will usually see uh, a couple distributors per market. Uh, we are also sold uh, through a few uh, flooring manufacturers as well for some of those areas where our distribution does not meet and they will sell it on their own projects as well. Awesome. All right. Anybody else have any other questions? Go ahead and submit those now. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap up here. Anything else you want to talk about, Dan? Uh, no, I think that, that should do it. All right. Awesome. Well, on behalf of FCICA, thank you, Dan, um, for presenting today's webinar, sponsored by GCP Applied Technologies. Uh, SIMS, you may now navigate to your education credit profile to submit credit for this webinar. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.